Welcome to The Lawyer's Podcast, a series of conversations about law practice. Each week, we talk with legal entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. And now, here are your hosts. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Stephanie Everett. And this is episode 257 of the Lawyers Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're trying something a little new with Jennifer Longton, and we'll tell you more about that in a minute. If today's podcast resonates with you and you haven't read the Small Firm Roadmap yet, get the first chapter right now for free at lawyers.com slash book. You know, recently somebody commented that getting the first chapter for free felt like, you know, pushing a promotion on them, which I think is funny. And it's worth stopping for a moment and just say, it's actually just the first chapter of the book. It's not like if all you want is the first chapter, just get the first chapter. No, you don't have to read anymore. And in fact, one of the reasons we're doing that is because if the first chapter resonates with you, then you might want to buy the book, of course, but it's not like the first chapter is, there's nothing in it. It's just the first chapter of a good book. So I don't know, check it out. Anyway, today's podcast is brought to you by GNGF, Text Expander, Rankings.io, and Back Office Betty's. We wouldn't be able to do the show without their support, so please stay tuned. We'll tell you more about them later on. So today we're experimenting, which actually the name of our program is called Lab, which means that's where you go to do experiments, mm-hmm. right? So I love that we're now going to bring a little bit of our experimenting to the podcast. Well, and I mean, let's not bury the lead here. This is your hosting debut as well. Oh. Your interviewer debut. Yay. Starting off the new year. Yeah, Aaron has done one interview, and other than that, it's been only me. And so this is your debut. And yeah, I mean, don't fuck it up, Stephanie. <laughs> well, <we'll see. laughs> I've already listened not... to it, so I know you haven't. <laughs> no, well, let's but let's tell people what we're doing here because yeah. I think some context is going to help. So what we're doing is we decided to bring our listeners of the podcast behind the scenes on a coaching call that I conduct with one of our labsters, Jennifer Longton. You talked about this, obviously. Jennifer knows it's being recorded and knows it's going to yes. be on the podcast. <laughs> we're not ambushing anyone. And we've edited it in a way where nothing, you know, that she didn't want disclosed would be disclosed. So that's part of the reason for some of the, you know, edits, which will make sense when you hear it, I think. But first, I think it's important that we just tell everyone like, okay, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because it's a little different, but it keeps occurring to us. We keep hearing from lawyers that they really don't know what a coaching call looks like or feels like or sounds like, or why you would even want to work with a coach. You know, if you've never done it, I could appreciate that you would be like, what happens? And, Mm -hmm. and by the way, because I am a certified coach, there's a difference between how a life coach might approach a a coaching call and how we approach it with business clients and then lab. And so I know how to do both and have that flexibility. But also if you've worked with a life coach before, and I've heard this from some people who are considering lab, a traditional coaching call is very much driven by the participant where I would just be like, what do you want to talk about today? And they're Mm. like, uh, I don't know. We do some of that, but we also have the flexibility. You put more structure on this. Yeah. With the lab, we have a lot more structure. Well, and I I think the other reason we wanted to do it this way is longtime listeners will know that I will occasionally do, you know, something in the nature of a small firm profile. Like what is your firm? What are you working on? That kind of stuff. And it's always felt a little bit weird to us because like we want to show on the one hand, people who are, you know, doing a great job of employing the concepts that we have been teaching about and writing about and that are now embodied in our book. But also I don't want to hold people out as the experts when they're still working on these things. And I think the coaching call format is a really great way of showing what it looks like to be working on these issues without necessarily holding the guest out as the master of this topic. It's more of a, here's what a work in progress from somebody who is hustling and succeeding and doing a great job and figuring it out looks like. Yeah. So, And I think the same thing happens when we mastermind, by the way, I think for our listeners today, when you hear somebody else and what they're struggling with and maybe what approach they're going to take to solving it, I hope is that it will unlock something for you. Even if you don't have the exact same problem, sometimes it will put a new spin on it for you or you'll approach a problem that you're having in a new way. And so, you know, our hope is that this is super helpful. So tee this up for us. We're going to listen to just a segment of your conversation where Jen is kind of struggling with the tension between her nature, which is very giving. And she's the kind of lawyer who I think lots of us are like, like feel bad about charging for the work. 
right? She would love to give everything away for free if she could, but she's recognizing that she needs to have a viable business and a successful business and she's doing a great job of it. But also she needs, you know, she wants to be able to pay her employees well and make decent money herself and can't just be sacrificial about this. And so she's trying to balance those two things, right? Yeah. And so we've been, I've been working with Jen for a while now. And one of the things we have been working on is what direction she wants to take her firm. And mm -hmm. so we've been doing a lot of work around different options that she's exploring and thinking about and what, what would work best for her. You actually got to see some of this work at LabCon because she's really focused in on her KPIs. There was a great moment where she realized like which parts of her firm were making money and losing money. And she was trying to balance. I mean, it's losing money, but I really want to do it. So how do I, you know, make sure that I'm getting the balance right? Yeah. Yeah, it was really powerful actually to see her realize that. Yeah, because I think a lot of lawyers, you kind of manage by your gut, right? Like, I feel like this, and so this must be okay or right. And then when we actually tease out and have the data in front of us, it can be super powerful messaging about what is actually happening in our business. So she's been doing that great work, and now she's totally into the data and understands how important that is for her business. But I think what you'll hear some of the tension is that's not where her natural inclination goes. And she's trying to figure out how to navigate this new piece in the future and how she's going to use that to help improve her firm. There is some background here. So we talked with Jen in episode 206 about the way that she's going about implementing low cost options for clients, payment plans, having conversations about money with clients, even though they're paying less. So she talks about that a fair amount. And then in episode 249, we talked with Todd Herman about the alter ego effect. Yeah. And this comes up to in your conversation with Jen about um, how she's approaching trying to get in the mindset to be a law firm finance thinker versus a bleeding heart, softy public interest attorney. Yeah, good point. <laughs> Todd Herman, who wrote The Alter Ego Effect, did a workshop for us in lab where he helped us walk through this process. So, Oh, right. Yeah, you did a great session with him. Yeah, so we kind of start talking about The Alter Ego Effect as if everybody will just know what that is. Because... Right, yeah. Because everybody in lab does because they yes. had him to themselves for an hour or so, which is obviously not available to everyone, but Labster's got that. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, so what do you think? Should we see how this experiment goes. Yeah, I'd love to hear from people. Um, you know, let us know in the Facebook group or shoot us an email. The email is email at lawyerist.com if people don't know, or you can use the contact page on the site. But I'd love to know what you think about the format. If you'd like more of it, our plan is to to bring you sections of coaching calls maybe once a month. I don't, I don't know if we'll hit a regular schedule or not, but to sprinkle them in here and there so that we can kind of show you the sausage being made, I guess. So let us know. And uh, we've got a brief sponsored conversation with Mark Homer from GNGF about where you should be spending your money on advertising in 2020. And then we'll have Stephanie's conversation with Jen Longton. Hi, I'm Mark Homer, author of Online Law Practice Strategies and founder of GNGF. Welcome, Mark, to the very first podcast of 2020. And since it's the first podcast of 2020, and since you are an, an expert and a thought leader on marketing, maybe you could help our listeners figure out where to be spending their money in 2020. Should they be putting more of their marketing budget towards SEO, or should they be paying for ads and working on their pay-per-click campaigns? Where is their money best spent? Well, uh, <laughs> I have to say I get that question a lot. I bet. Sam, uh, <laughs> so one thing, though, I mean, obviously we're jumping into New Year. So in addition to thinking about, you know, your marketing, hopefully a lot of law firm owners are thinking about their business itself, right? So what is their business strategies? What are their personal goals, business goals? I think it's really important to back up and say SEO, PPC, those are all tactics. But we need to know what the marketing strategy is. And you don't know what your marketing strategy is until you really understand where you want your business to go. Yeah. And like my thought is, you know, New Year's resolutions are a waste of time, but starting your year with a picture of where you want your year to end up is a great idea, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. And, and it helps you understand what are some measurable things, right? So if you can really get your business goals into measurable things, and it's easier to get your marketing strategy into something you can have a conversation, uh, whether it's internally um, uh, with, with your team or with an agency, you can talk about, here's the specific things I'm looking for this year out of our marketing to support my business goal. Do you have some examples of what a marketing strategy, a simple marketing strategy might be and how that would impact marketing spend and, and where you dedicate your time and money? Absolutely. Uh, so there's a couple of good examples for 
kind of like the ends of the spectrum. You've got somebody who's saying, hey, I just hired somebody uh, recently, brought them on and, you know, revenue is really tight, didn't take home as much as I, I did maybe the previous year. So I'd really like to get, you know, I just need more clients coming in the door so we can support the staff that we're, we're growing, mm -hmm. you know, so need more revenue, need more clients. That uh, is going to drive a strategy of, you know, okay, we need to maybe spend money, invest money to drive uh, more leads in the door. I need to focus on turning those into clients for this staff. The other end of the spectrum is we have clients who will tell us, you know what, I love working on this type of thing. I want to spend more time on, you know, vacation. We've got one client that takes off five weeks a year, <laughs> uh, which you know, is awesome. They live in Alaska. So maybe that's, you know, part of it getting out of town for five weeks when it's dark. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they wanted to focus on the quality of the cases. They want to work on things that they love to work on. And they wanted to be able to have the quality of life. That's a very different strategy, right? So it was much more around you know, positioning them as the expert in a very particular area. So they got to kind of name their price and, and take what they wanted. Two very different tactics associated to those strategies because of their business goals. I'm curious, since we have a little bit of time, what will you say to a lawyer who comes into you and says, I've tried this online marketing thing. It makes my phone ring a lot and it all sucks. I assume that implies a strategy to me of quality over quantity and you might focus in a different place there. Correct. Yeah. So oftentimes, and we get that, we'll talk to people who come and say, okay, you know, like uh, I, I saw you guys speak here. It sounds like you know what you're talking about, but, the but. <laughs> this stuff doesn't work, you know, the, uh, but this doesn't stuff, or, or it's always the, this doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. I know it works for somebody else. Right. And it, typically we can dive into it and figure out it. Oftentimes it's a mismatch of somebody, you know, like the agency thinks they're doing a great job because they're sending more and more leads and they're, you know, patting themselves on the back. But the lawyer or, you know, a, a marketing director, whoever it is at, at the law firm, hasn't really worked back with the agency to kind of give the feedback loop of this is junk, mm -hmm. you know, until maybe like six, seven months after paying a lot of money, they're like fed up. So getting that feedback loop as fast as possible to, you know, what's coming in the door versus what you're spending to get something in the door, then you can adjust strategy. So you can, maybe you're, you know, focusing too much on SEO and you're getting a lot of junk and that's going to happen. Um, you could be maybe more laser targeted with a different tactic like paid advertising or, or maybe, you know, speaking on seminars. There's all kinds of offline right. things too, right? It's not all online. So listeners should be focusing on what their goals are, building a strategy designed to get to them to those goals by whatever their timeline is and then allocating their money appropriately. Sounds good. Correct. That's the strategy we approach. So you've put together a book about marketing in small practice that listeners can find at gngf.com slash lawyerist. And you've generously offered to give the first 100 people to sign up for one a free paperback copy of the book, which is a $50 value. And anyone who misses that will not be left out in the cold. They'll get an ebook, which is awesome. And listeners, if you'd like to learn more about things like marketing strategy, goal setting, tactics, spend. You can learn more from the videos on GNGF's Facebook page, which you can find by searching for GNG Found on Facebook or going to gngf.tv for a link that takes you straight there. Mark, thanks so much. Thanks, Sam. What is the next most important thing for your business right now? So with our model, I have constantly worked on getting our mix of cases to a third, a third, a third. And that's because we have our private business, our low bono program, our care program, and our state paid public defense work. We've done a really good job at reducing our public defense work, or I don't want to say reducing, but upping the quality, reducing the quantity and really trying to just be on the cases where our expertise is important. And then our care program is doing pretty well. It's at about 27% right now, so it can still go up. But our private program did just take a dip because we had some cases closed. And so for me, it's working, especially the family consulting angle of my business and, and helping family members help their loved ones through this criminal process. Um, and trying to build that part of the business. And that's some of the networking that I'm doing this month. Like I'm speaking this afternoon to a bunch of psychologists about their clients and how they can help along with their kind of criminal interactions. Because unfortunately, that's a big part of mental health therapy, especially at a high level. So trying to figure out 
I spent the whole year reducing the public work. Well, now our caseloads are just low. And so we've got, but I don't want to just backfill it with a bunch of public work. So I want to really work on getting that pipeline. And again, that's the advertising and the SEO and why I'm going that way. But back again to the KPIs, the only way I would know all this is at the beginning of this year, when I said it's really important to get to a third, a third, a third, and it's really important to have the right caseload mix, I started tracking caseload by attorney and caseload by type. So the way I'm able to see all this is that I have the numbers every month for what percentages each takes up not only the caseload, but then I have another, my bookkeeper pulls together some numbers for me. That's the percentage of our income from each division, which is very different than the percentage of cases. Right. So I look at both of them, but just trying to control that and figure out how to up that private business, how to people want what we have. They just don't know it exists because we're the only ones doing it. So it's, it's not that I'm trying to convince people that they need me. The minute people find out that we exist, they're like, wow, I really need you or I really needed you two years ago. So just accessing that public. So I'm curious because it sounds like you've been able to drill down that, you know, 60% of cases are coming from Google. Is that across the board? Are you able to drill down now into the private work and where are those like specifically where the private cases coming from? Where does that break down? So that's just private cases. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. And we do break it down depending on, I I do have percentages of care cases and private cases. And then I don't know if I could drill it down. I'd have to talk to Chad with like care cases and what the intake is on that and private cases, what the intake is on that. I'll have to look at my dashboard. I have a pretty good dashboard. So Yeah, I might be able to find that out. A couple of my big full pay cases have come from Google. I do know that. Because the nice thing about the Google keywords, like I said, I've been doing it myself very awkwardly. But the nice thing is it's not that expensive because the keywords that I'm using, no one's paying for. So they're super cheap. And it's just, if someone is looking for these keywords, they're looking for us. And that's what's been really nice about trying to design that. And that's why I think it it makes sense to throw some money behind it at this point, because I think it can do a lot of really good things for where we're at. Awesome. We're going to take a quick break. Unlock your team's productivity with Text Expander. You can easily insert text snippets in any application from a library created by you and your team. You'll reduce errors and increase productivity. Text Expander can save you so much time, it's like getting an extra employee. Text Expander is available for Mac, Windows, iPhone, and iPad, and Chrome. Show listeners can get 20% off their first year. Visit textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander. Support for today's episode comes from Rankings.io, a search engine optimization agency working exclusively for personal injury law firms. Simply put, Rankings.io helps personal injury law firms dominate first page rankings. You'll never have to chase them for an update or hunt them down for an answer. Your clients expect you to be accessible and Rankings will meet that standard for communication and transparency with you too. You'll have a full team of SEO specialists fighting to put you at the top of Google search results. Personal injury lawyer SEO is all they do, so all of their processes, playbooks, and people are completely focused on generating qualified cases for your firm. Best of all, you'll be one of an elite few. Delivering exceptional service and results requires focus, so Rankings.io carefully vets clients before accepting them. They're an ideal fit for growth-oriented personal injury law firms. To see if you're a fit, visit Rankings.io slash lawyerist to get started. Support for today's episode comes from Back Office Betty's, the only virtual receptionist company exclusively dedicated to small law firms that offers unlimited calls. Betty's Boutique Service boasts customized call handling and virtual assistant services provided by highly trained, relentlessly friendly team members ready to help grow your firm even when you're out of the office. Visit backofficebetty's.com slash lawyers to get a free one-week trial and use the promo code podcast to receive $150 off your first month of service. Okay, we're back and I'm just curious, what does help look like for you right now? So I'm reading, I just finished The One Thing which I desperately am in need of because like even we assigned rocks like team rock projects at our last retreat and I picked up like three, which is silly, right? My only rock is getting this advertising stuff done and that's what I need to focus on, but I'm trying to do a bunch of stuff. So 
I constantly need help with that. And right now I'm reading the alter ego and I really need to work on like financial gen and figuring out who that is, because I think what's stopping us from being profitable, actually, I know is partially my own spending habits and like what we're spending money on and what's worth it and what's not. And so I'm really looking at that, but I think I need to, it's more internal work right now, but as a firm, we're looking towards maybe franchising or exporting our model to other people in, in some way down the line. And so to me, that means right now, and it's the budget, it's the structure, it's everything. It's just getting us as dialed in over the next year as we possibly can, because we've done so much work to get where we are. But it's little things. It's like our standard procedures are great, but they're overwhelming and no one really uses them. Our technology is really useful and great, but it needs to be integrated and streamlined. Our data security is like, okay, but it needs to be better. You know, we just, our marketing department needs to not be me. It's just all that kind of stuff that needs to shift to make it more of a stable model instead of something that is a universe that revolves around me. I'd like to get out of the sun. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's a good phrase. Thanks. It's very hot in here. <laughs> yeah, so let's explore that a little bit more. So one thing that's been really helpful that we've started doing as a team recently is when we have all the possible rocks on the board, right? Those ideas of be- rock is that bigger project that you know is going to, it's going to be more than just like an afternoon. It's going to be a heavier lift. Right. Asking ourselves does this make us money? Does this save us money? And if not, you know, or is it, and sometimes it's, it it does neither. Right. And then how much, like how much money would this make us or how much money would this save us as a way of starting to frame tasks, like our projects, like not because sometimes I see people just want to do things because it looks fun or it looks like, you know, that, that shiny, shiny object syndrome, right? Like, Oh, we, we, we should, we should do this. Asking us this, these financial questions doesn't mean that we're only going to do things that make us money or save us money, but it's another way of framing it to help us really see, is this the next most important thing? Like, is this going to drive the business forward? It's just a way of helping us answer that question. Is this really necessary to drive the business forward? You know, and will we see an immediate result from it? Or is it something that if we do it now, we'll see a result from it like a year from now? And again, not that we'll never do it, but just to help us start, because sometimes those things that are a year from now, it's like, well, yeah, we actually need to take the first steps or it's never going to happen, but it's just a way to help sort of start putting some legwork around and prioritizing around, well, what makes the most sense right now? Because sometimes if we're only focused on things that are too long-term, you know, we have to, we, we have to have a good mix, I guess, is, you know, to the point, just like you've realized you need the third, the third, the third in your case mix. Mm-hmm. We need the, almost the same type of mix thinking about our business and what we want to focus on next. I totally see what you're saying. And I think that that, I mean, it, I like your questions because that's not how I think it rocks, right? I am, I took, we, at our retreat, we all took the color personality test and then we used it as a way to discuss how we communicate with each other. And it was awesome. We actually wound up using it as our language for the whole weekend and It was really fun, but I am very blue. Sometimes the secondary color changes a little bit, but I'm very blue. I am very Mother Teresa altruistic. I do things because people need them. I do things to help people. And that's great. And I need to have that because that's who I am. And that's what my business is driven around. And that's what people come to us for. But I mean, we've got to start really making a financial return because I have great people working for me and they deserve to be paid more and, and just taken care of more than I can right now. And that's very important to me. So I'm trying to use the alter ego program to get in and be like, okay, who's financial gen? Like I need to become a just stickler on the budget. And I'm not, I don't even look at expenses every month. Like money is something that terrifies me. I look at the overall numbers, but I don't sit down and like, look at the whole list. I mean, I need to start doing stuff like that. And so trying to dial in how I can bring that out of myself, because it's all, I mean, I was always told that I'm bad at math, which I'm actually not, but right. people have always told me that because right. I'm a girl and my stepdad, who's raised me and I adore, but he will 
be the first to admit he used to yell about math problems to me and my siblings because he's an engineer and he just couldn't get why we didn't get it. So, so I need to figure out how to bring that out and not push it away. Yeah. So I, I don't know the, co- I know a lot of the assessments. I'm not as dialed in with color assessment. What color is somebody who's financially savvy and great with budgets and into the details of the numbers? Like, what would that be? Um, I would say it's a very gold personality type, which is super low for me. So gold is very rule following and organized and it it doesn't necessarily correspond to who's financially savvy, but it's more towards who is very direct and forward and like what you see is what you get. And they tend to like numbers more because they're very binary, right? There's not gray area. And I am a sea of gray. Got it. That's my whole mindset. (laughs) So um, one of the things Todd Herman teaches in the alter ego effect is how to put on these different personas when we need them. And I love the fact that in your case, you're using the idea of color and I can see you on video right now. You're wearing blue today. And that makes sense when you're, yeah. I mean, it makes sense for who you are as an attorney doing the mental health care work that you do. I mean, that totally makes sense when you said blue and you described it. I am curious if we could maybe use gold and specifically you need some gold things. So I'm thinking that whenever we block out on your calendar, when you're going to be financial savvy, Jen, maybe you even block it out in gold in your calendar. And then what kind of gold right. things do you have or that you could use when you're going to be in the gold mindset. Like, I don't know if you wear gold or you have gold pins or you could get a gold hat. Like let's brainstorm, but what's some gold stuff? So we just got these. Yeah. So Can you gold, see it? It's, yeah. Buddy, it's Buddy the Buck. It's your, it's your logo on a gold pin. I love it. So <laughs> you know what? Can we just, can we agree that you only use that gold pin when you're being financially savvy, Jen, or do you like using it all the time? I like using it all the time, but this one's rose gold. So we have a bunch kicking around the office. I will find the gold one. And I totally agree with that. I also, um, I've been trying, I'm in the totem chapter right now. So this is very timely. I've also thought of the placebo pill effect that he talks about and getting green Tic Tacs and taking a money pill. Like before I sit down to work on financial stuff, like I just take a money pill because, you know. I take prescription medication. I should be able, for other mindsets like depression, I might as well take prescription medication for the fact that I don't really like numbers. And then I also like the idea of a necklace or something. I wore this today because it's one of my fancier necklaces. And I was like, maybe that's something. I'm just trying to play around with what I can take on. Because I, from a theater background and someone who worked in costuming, his whole system is how you build a character. I mean, yeah. it just, it makes so much sense to me because actors will always tell you that they don't really embody a character until they get into a costume. And if the costume's wrong and it doesn't add to your character, then it completely detracts from your performance. So I'm very much on board with that. It's just drilling down and trying to figure out exactly who my alter ego is yeah, and what she likes to carry. I but that's that. what I need. I need to dial that in. (laughs) Yeah. I'm thinking I, like you said that, and I, I agree. Like I know you did theater and I did as well. And like, I'm almost envisioning, like you need to go on a search for like a gold glitter jacket with green dollar signs all over it. I have no idea, but like, it could be crazy and it could be something you only wear when you're being financial gen, right? Like, so that you really get into that or whatever it, it needs to work for you. I but I think that that might be your next piece of homework is finding okay. a costume for the, because I, it does, it works, right? And like, yes. to trigger Oh, that it totally kind of, works. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that's good. I, I'm so I'm listening to the audiobook because I always do audiobooks, but I'm really glad that you guys sent us this book because now I'm gonna go through once I'm done with the audiobook and use the paper book as a workbook and kind of write all over it to go through because it is hard to I mean you can think about this stuff while you're driving and listening to a book, but you can't really sit down and journal it. So Right. And I don't remember if you were there live, but we did a workshop with Todd for yep, our live, I was there. Yeah, for our live community. And it was great because he walked us, you know, we did that role play where he walked one of our members through creating something like this and her case for her marketing self, which I think a lot of lawyers struggle with as well. Like, how do I think of putting on my marketing hat? Because I'm uncomfortable, I have to talk about myself or I have to 
be salesy or all these things that we associate with it, which isn't right. And so I, I love that was really helpful. All right. So I think let's maybe map out, let's put a little bit more details around this, but I think we're headed down the right path because it's clear that one of your next pieces to focus on is getting really intentional about finances for 2020. I like that phrasing. Awesome. So maybe let's stop the recording here, but you and I can continue to work and map out some specifics because I know we're going to talk about numbers and I want to be sensitive to that since this is our first time experimenting on a, with a coaching session on the podcast. But I hope our listeners got a sense of, of what these calls are like and how we work through issues. And yeah, and I don't know if, how it was for you. Hopefully we've already covered some great stuff. I'm excited. Always a pleasure. All right. Thanks, Jen. Are you interested in implementing the ideas you've heard on today's podcast into your law firm? Could you use a little help? Hey guys, it's Stephanie, the VP of Community Success here at Lawyers, and I'd love to help you tackle your business or take it to the next level. Head over to go.lawyerist.com backslash start to sign up for a quick call with me, and let's talk about how Lawyerist can help you create your best law firm. Make sure to catch next week's episode of The Lawyerist Podcast by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast app. And please leave a rating to help other people find our show. You can find the notes for today's episode on lawyerist.com slash podcast. The Lawyerist Podcast is edited by Paul Fisher. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you.